Hello and welcome to iScience Radio. It's just me, Flo, hosting you this evening while Emma's producing today um, alongside Sharon and Katie. Uh, before we talk about news recommendations, we have our first song, The Detectorist, um, theme tune by Johnny Flynn. Will you search through the lonely earth for me? Climb through the briar and brambles. I'll be your treasure. I felt the touch of the kings and the breath of the wind. I knew the call of all the songbirds. They sang all the wrong words. I'm waiting for you. I'm waiting for you. was lovely I haven't heard that before um so now for the news so we have Gabby here for that thank you again for having me sorry I was absent last week yeah, so we missed you yeah I know <laughs> Moderna recently launched a collaborative project with Merck for pharmaceutical company to develop an mRNA vaccine combined with existing antibodies that can target melanoma which is a specific type of skin cancer so we've become quite familiar with the mRNA vaccines. You know, they were used to fight against uh, COVID-19 and the whole pandemic. This type of a vaccine containing mRNA sequences can produce proteins relevant to certain diseases. In the case of COVID-19, the protein of interest was a spike protein, which induced the immune responses. But the mRNA vaccine and sequence that Moderna and Merck are using can produce a protein that triggers the T cell actions that are relevant to melanoma. So at the end of last year, the research team announced promising results from the preparable trials. The vaccines can apparently reduce the risk of death and the progress or recurrence of cancer following the resection of the tumors with higher efficacy than the monotherapies. So this basically means that, you know, people when they take these vaccines, they're going to have a more likely chance to fight against this type of cancer. So this can even provide, quote unquote, a new paradigm in the treatment of cancer patients. And that comes from Paul Burton, the chief medical officer of Moderna. So this is kind of really exciting. We can hopefully expect more clinical trials from the bio from BioNTech, who's working with the NHS right now to produce similar mRNA vaccines and Moderna. So hopefully we'll be able to see this in the coming year. Now, in other news, there will be a comet that will be viewable for the first time in 50,000 years, which I believe Flo is going to tell us more about. Yeah, so Sharon um, told us about this and prepared some information for me to share with you guys. So, um, yeah, so this um, this is the first viewing-worthy comet of the year, um, and it's about to be visible with the naked eye. It's named Comet C2022E3ZTF. Um, and we'll go in, into the naming conventions in a minute because it's quite interesting. Um, and it was first observed by the Zwicky Transient Research Facility in March 2022. Um, so yeah, for the naming rules of Comet, um, they're named by a letter of the alphabet, most commonly C or P, plus the year of the discovery, and then plus the half moon letter. And then finally, the order of the comets discovered in that half moon. Um, in the case of the comet we're about to observe, C stands for a comet with no period or a period of more than two th 200 years. E, as the fifth letter of the alphabet, means that the event in which the comet was discovered was the fifth 
half of the year, um, i.e. the first half of March. Um, and then three is the third comet discovered. The ZTF in parentheses um, is the name of the discoverer or organisation, so in this case the Zwicky Transient Research Facility. Um, about this comet in particular, it's emerald green in colour um, with a bright and broad tail. Um, although small in size, it will fly very close to Earth. Um, it is travelling very fast, um, and tonight comet C2022E3 ZTF will pass 10 degrees away from Polaris, uh, magnitude 2 apparently, um, in the constellation Ursa Minor, um, and I believe that's the bear one actually, Ursa is like a bear. Um, don't quote me on that, sorry, this is off script of Sharon's information, but that uh, surprised me with the Ursa thing. Um, and on the night from the February the 1st to the 2nd, the comet will pass through the constellation Cam Camello Pardalis, um, sorry about that pronunciation, which has no stars brighter than a magnitude of four. And on the same night, the comet will come closest to the Earth and reach its maximum brightness of a magnitude five. Um, at that time, it will be about 0.28 astronomical units or about 42 million kilometers from Earth. Um, and then how to see it, which is probably the thing that most people will be wondering about. Um, as with other astronomical observations, dark places away from the city are best for observing. Um, if the weather is clear, we can spot a sky full of stars. Although London has been full of clouds recently um, and the city is heavily light polluted, we still have the opportunity to see comets when the clouds are clear. Um, a couple of tricks that will make it easier for you to spot the comet. Um, so the first thing is to let your eyes adapt to darkness. You need at least 15 minutes to adjust to the darkness um, and this will boost your vision, sens vision sensitivity and make it easier to see the faint comet. Um, to keep the effect, avoid looking at bright lights including phone screens. Um, and another thing you can do is try averted vision. Due to our eye structure, it is easier to notice dim objects when we look not directly but slightly away from them. Astronomers use averted vision both when observing with the naked eye and with optical devices. Um, if you want to know exactly where the comet is in the sky, you can use an app such as Star, Star Walk, uh, which will guide you in the direction of the comet. Um, a combination of camera and tripod will be a great aid for photographing. Um, photographing sorry. Um, the, blah, blah, blah. Um, a combination of camera and tripod will be a great aid for photographing the night sky. Um, and then all this info and the recommendations on viewing came from a website called starwalk.space. Um, so if you'd like to read more about this or the topic of comments in general, um, then it's quite a good website to check out. Um, I hope you all have a great once in a lifetime stargazing experience. Um, and yeah, so that brings us to the end of the news section, um, us hijacking it a bit from Gabby this week. Um, and then we just have one piece of sort of more local news to um, the science communication and so science media production course um, for iScience. Um, and this Thursday at 8 p.m., iScience will be live streaming um, a play called A Bunch of Scientists on Spring Break, um, and that'll be on our YouTube channel. Um, it's basically a live stream play reading about exactly that, a bunch of scientists on spring break. Um, so make sure you keep an eye on our socials because we'll provide the link or you can just have a look at our YouTube channel um, and it will go live at 8pm. Um, and to lead us into our next section, um, and you'll see why after the song, uh, we'll play the Jurassic Park theme tune.
that was the Jurassic Park theme tune. Um, We had Jocelyn on the show last week and this week we will be hearing her interviews with three PhD contributors, um, Davide Foffa, Emma Dunn and Paul Barry. Scientists have long questioned when and how flight evolved in pterosaurs, commonly referred to as pterodactyls. They were the first vertebrates to ever fly and the only reptiles to do so, but compared to, for example, how dinosaurs evolved into birds, we know very little about them, especially their early days back in the um, Triassic era. Before dinosaurs became the dominant reptiles in the Jurassic later on. Um, For many reasons, studying pterosaur remains Remain, oh my God. Um, studying pterosaur remains is incredibly difficult and studying the remains of their relatives is even harder. Now with the help of modern technology, paleontologists are beginning to piece the puzzle together. Recently a team of scientists used CT scans to do exactly that and reclassified a fossil called Scleromoclus, Scleromoclus um, originally thought to be a dinosaur or crocodile ancestor as a member of a group called Legapatids. The pterosaurs closest cousins. Um, Drawing this new link in the evolutionary tree uncovers very important details about reptilian flight evolution. Reporter, our reporter, Jocelyn Weiss, um, takes us on a trip back in time where paleontologists Paul Barrett, Emma Dunn and Davide Foffer himself um, explain what they found, how they found it and what it means. Let's go back 230 million years. It's a hot day in Pangaea. How hot? 45 degrees Celsius. That's pretty hot. Especially when you're living in what someday will become a part of northern Scotland. But you're nimble and pretty small, so you can handle it. You walk around on your hind limbs and examine your environment. What's this? A prehistoric insect. Sounds delicious. You scamper after it and enjoy the tasty morsel for lunch. You look around at some of your cousins, but you still don't know that someday their descendants will be the first reptiles to take flight. The Legopatids are a fairly obscure group of animals known only from the Triassic period, so between about 250 and about 230 million years ago. Dr. Paul Barrett is a paleontologist at the Natural History Museum in London. They're known mainly from the Southern Hemisphere, and they're not generally very complete fossils. They're often found from just bits and pieces of skeletons, so they've not been very well studied or very well understood until recently, when a few new specimens have been found that helped fill in some of the gaps in their anatomy. So these little animals used to be thought to be something to do with the origin of dinosaurs. It turned out that actually they are the closest relatives of the flying reptiles. Dinosaurs couldn't fly. So the term flying reptiles actually refers to a specific group, the pterosaurs, sometimes more casually called the pterodactyls. We think that the common ancestor of the flying reptiles and of the legerpetids would have looked a little bit like a legerpetid, a little kind of bipedal, fast running animal that probably spent most of its time running around forest floor trying to catch insects. They are totally overshadowed by pterosaurs and dinosaurs as the two more interesting groups. That's Professor Emma Dunn, a paleontologist and expert on all things Triassic. The Ligurpidids are super interesting in and of themselves, where they live like we don't know any modern reptiles living as. They are nimble creatures, kind of like modern desert rats, maybe gerboas or kangaroo rats. And they are now modern mammals, but back in the Triassic, this ecological niche was likely taken up by reptiles. Pterosaurs have always been difficult for scientists to study. Their bones are hollow and easily breakable. Unlike dinosaurs, at the end of the Cretaceous period, they were already dying out, being outcompeted by birds and bats so they have no modern descendants. Scientists didn't know where in the fossil record to look or what to look for. That is, until now. Pterosaurs have always been a problem. And that's because the oldest pterosaur that we have has wings. It's unmistakably a pterosaur. That's Dr. Davide Fafa, a researcher at Virginia Tech. And his team, including Paul and Emma, recently re-evaluated a set of fossils that had been puzzling scientists for years. Enter Scleromoclus, 
It was originally thought to be a dinosaur ancestor, but it's now identified as a Ligurpetid. In other words, part of the group of those rat-like reptiles munching on insects 230 million years ago. Scleromoclus is special because it's the first known Ligurpetid in the Northern Hemisphere. Scleromoclus is part of a group of reptiles that are called Elgin reptiles because they are found around the area of Elgin, which is a little town in the northeast of Scotland. So how does a fossil for an animal that was adapted to living in searing hot conditions end up in Northern Scotland? Pangaea in the Triassic was this big landmass, and it was situated very much in the centre of the globe. The Elgin reptiles, which are now found in modern-day Scotland, were living close to the equator at this time. And as Pangaea started to break off, we began to see more coastlines. This is then how Scotland, or modern-day Scotland, began to be transported to a more temperate climate and has the climate it has today. The fauna that surrounded it were found buried by desert dunes, which is not something you expect when you go to visit Scotland nowadays. So how did Scleromoclus live? What niche did it occupy? It probably spent most of its time on the forest floor. It's a very small animal, a foot long altogether, and it's probably running around nipping at little insects and things like that and trying to stay out of the stomachs of other larger crocodile-like animals and also some animals related to ourselves on the lineage that eventually leads to mammals. So there's a, an animal called Ornithosuchus that comes from the same fossil beds related to crocodiles that was a much larger predator and animal reaching a couple of metres in length sounds scary. It would have been scary. It would have been a very serious looking animal with large, sharp, curved teeth. So why wasn't Scleromoclus identified as a pterosaur relative until now? The Triassic is super fragmented, generally speaking, and we very rarely find full fossils of creatures. But when we do, they're super interesting. But we're working with fossils that don't have animals that look like them nowadays that we can compare with very easily, particularly their bone structure. And the reason we can do it now is because these days we can put it into a CT scanner and we can use that CT scanner to build a beautiful virtual 3D model and then we can fill in the gaps and look at those filled in models to actually look at the anatomy in a lot of detail. So let's recap. Pterosaurs were the only reptiles to ever fly. Their closest relatives were a group of tiny rodent-like reptiles called Lagerpetids that only lived in the Triassic 230 million years ago. Davide Fafa and a team of scientists used CT scans to reclassify a fossil of a creature called Scleromoclus as one of these Lagerpetids, and therefore a cousin of pterosaurs. So in the grand scheme of paleontology, why is this such a big deal? Because as far as we can tell, Scleromoclus is the most primitive member of that family. It also helps to define what the common ancestor of Lagerpetids and pterosaurs would have looked like. It helps to narrow down the range of possibilities. And also the age of Scleromoclus helps to narrow down the window in which we should be looking for that ancestor of pterosaurs and the very earliest flying reptiles. And so we now have about a 10 million year window in which we should be looking to try and find those very earliest flying reptiles. So this new analysis brings us one step closer to finally solving the mystery of when pterosaurs first started flying.
guess I can't understand why you don't understand me, baby. And every day I wake up and I make money for myself. I know we share, but you know that I don't need your help. Do you understand? You don't understand me, baby. That was The Steps by Heim. Um, and now into our new Agony Aunt section, uh, which we're promoing today. Or pre- is it promoing, previewing? Yeah, I think previewing. Yeah, previewing testing today, out. testing it out. Um, so I have with me, um, as you will have heard, Katie Thompson. Hey. Um, and she's here to answer some questions we've received over the past week. So our first one, Katie, is do worms have five hearts or is that a myth? I'm just going to start off by saying this is my favourite one that we received. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't want to be biased. I'm grateful to all the questions we got, mm-hmm. but I do love this question. Um, and the answer is kind of, um, because worms don't actually have hearts in the way that we're imagining them. So a human heart is made up of multiple chambers, but a worm's heart is actually made up of arch-like structures, and these are called aortic arches. So the arches work together in pairs to form what we would consider a heart. So one worm has five pairs of these arches and they function in a similar way to a heart by pumping blood around the worm. So they kind of have five hearts and that they have five pairs of arches, um, but it's not really a heart. Yeah, I think that's like the same for quite a lot of animals. I'm like thinking yeah. in my head. Um, I think I think we can call it that that, that it would be because it is the equivalent. It is their version yeah. of a heart, right? So I'm going to say fact. Yeah, worms yeah. do have five hearts. Hundred percent a fact. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Verified no you doubt. Today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so now a different sort of topic. I would say a fairly um, important and deep one. Mm-hmm. Um, very um, of the day um, is how do we measure carbon carbon emissions for a country? Now, I think this one is is essentially just boils down to a game of estimation, but you can estimate pretty accurately. And most countries have, you know, government systems in place to work out these estimations of carbon emissions. But essentially, the International Panel on Climate Change very kindly provide countries with guidance on greenhouse gas emissions so that the process is standardised. The basic principle is, for example, if we know in the UK how much carbon dioxide is released by air travel, and we record the amount of air travel in the UK, you can multiply the two together to get an estimate. So you'd then basically repeat this process for all of the industrial production in the country and you'd get this sort of total figure of how much the UK releases. So for context, in the UK our 2020 net carbon dioxide emissions were over 320 million tonnes. Um, and actually that was set to increase post-COVID with everyone going out and about a bit more, industry perking up again, that sort of a thing. Um, but what does um, that much of carbon dioxide yeah, actually so mean? I was starting <laughs> to think, how do I know? Is that what, good, what bad, bad? Yeah. probably bad because we know, but... Yeah, it's pretty bad. Um, but to contextualise it, if we went outside right now, one tonne of carbon dioxide is enough to fill a sphere with a 10 metre diameter. So that's about Ooh. twice the height of a double-decker bus. So if you're imagining a sphere, a sphere based mm-hmm. on the diameter of two double-decker buses, um, it, that's one tonne. Oh that's not. Times that's that quite, by 320 quite, million. Quite big, isn't it? Yeah, and that's our contribution bit. in 2020. Um, so not, not great. Um, but carbon dioxide tends to be the place that people start with to measure greenhouse gas emissions because it means that then you can work out equivalent potencies of greenhouse, ga- greenhouse gases. So, for example, you you might hear about methane being 84 times the amount of carbon dioxide. So it's 84 times more potent than carbon dioxide. So one kilogram of methane would be like the equivalent of releasing 84 kilograms of carbon dioxide. Yeah. Great. Thank you for that. Um, Yeah, that's... um, I'm questioning my perception of, of everything now um, well i tell you what is kind of useful is that our website's online if you're interested about how much carbon dioxide or greenhouse gases you emit personally you can work out your own footprint so there's a lot of calculators online if you just search it um and then you can sort of work out what areas of your life you could cut down on 
Um, obviously, you know, individual action is great, but it's also collective action that's mm-hmm. important. So obviously the government needs to be held accountable as well for that sort of a thing. Yep, great advice. I'll be looking at my carbon footprint. I, I did definitely did it before uh, yeah, in school, but I haven't actually done it as a as an adult. So maybe that'll be a like, nice little fun activity. I think me. it's fun because you get fun. like to add in things like your travel or your transport. Yeah. Obviously, we have more control over our diet and that mm-hmm. sort of thing. So there's a bit more agency as an adult <laughs> as to what it actually yeah, means. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Great. Um, and then question three, why is the Victoria line so hot? Yeah, I think this is a pretty hard hitting question, to be honest, because uh, temperatures in the Victoria line have actually been reported to reach between 28 and 33 degrees Celsius. Which is mad. In peak summer. That's absolutely bonkers. Um, So I think probably it's best to start with where the heat actually comes from. Um, And it's unsurprising. It's just the friction from the trains braking and speeding up that creates a lot of heat. Mm -hmm. And this heat is then obviously trapped in the tunnels and also the tunnel walls. Now, the Victoria Line is completely underground, so ventilation is kind of a tricky task. Um, And also, London is built on top of a lot of clay, and clay is a great insulator. So it means any trapped heat takes a very long time to dissipate. So it's sort of going to hold on to it for a very, very long time. Also, because the Victoria Line is completely underground, it means that there's no colder air coming in in winter and being pushed around the tunnels, which a lot of the other lines benefit from. Mm. Um, But, you know, there is a plus side to that because it means no solar radiation is absorbed or trapped on super sunny days. So you might get a bit of relief in the summer. Um, But whoever submitted this question, I think, needs to consider themselves grateful, actually, because uh, the Victoria line is not as hot as the central line, apparently. Um, So get over it, maybe, might be my advice there. Can confirm the central line is very hot because that is the one (laughs) that I would get um, quite a lot. Um, so yes thank you Katie um, I think we've all learnt a lot this evening I definitely have um, and I like this section so I think we'll keep it based yeah. on no evidence other than my own opinion <laughs> um, and um, am I right in thinking that we're going to be on our socials yeah on our socials we're going to be advertising submit. so you can submit to us via a Google form any questions you might have your silliest science ponderings anything that you think of and go hmm I don't know the answer to that and I probably should feel free to send it in yeah and it will make it easier than you googling it yourself because we'll condense the info for you it's like going to like a generative ai chatbot putting it in and then we'll give you the answer so it's absolutely fine but better yeah because we're humans yeah (laughs) (laughs) topic for another day um (laughs) so yes thank you very much um and playing us out tonight will be subtitled by official hige hige not sure how to pronounce that one um (laughs) He gay. It's he gay. Sorry, everyone. So, official he gay. Um, subtitle. やけどしそうなほどのポジティブの冷たさと残酷さに気づいたんだよ
つように汗をかいてしまう僕なんかもどうしたって生ぬるくて君を痛めつけてしまうのだろう手のひらが熱いほど心は冷たいんでしょ冗談でもそんな残酷なこと言わないでよ別に言えばいいけど全人生をかけてもちゃんと覆さしてよ救いたい救われたいこのイコールが今優しく吐かしていく Yeah. 